Midnight Facts for Insomniac. <laughs> I just learned something. Oh, I'm having fun now. I'm rooting for world peace and for you to have a prehensile tale. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're a true friend. So first off, a quick correction. There he is. And a shout out to CJ Chipley from Instagram. He pointed out that America has more than three time zones. Mm. I forgot about mountain time. So there are four standard time zones in like the contiguous United States. Mm. And in fact, there are five other time zones that apply to the non-contiguous states and territories, Alaska and Hawaiian, Atlantic, Samoa. Mm. Uh, so yeah, uh, dope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, neckbearding, neckbeardington. Well, that's legit. I was yeah. only off by six time zones. That's, <laughs> I was 200% wrong. <laughs> it is difficult to be more than 100% wrong, but I pulled it off. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> we strive for a higher level of wrong here yeah, on Mivy. Yeah, I need to be careful about these random unvetted facts that I spew on a facts-based podcast, I think. <laughs> so thank you, CJ. I'm going to be more careful going forward. No. And this episode will be a palate cleanser. Hmm. The last topic was, wow. Was a little rough. <laughs> it was, I knew it would be rough. Right. And I knew what was going to come in the aftermath. Yeah. Uh, but that was still probably the most vigorous reaction to an episode that we've had. Well, well since the pony nightmare, yeah. It, it was the night of the ponies all over again. Yeah. But an entire hour of ponies. It was the episode of ponies. So I apologize retroactively, but you were warned. This is, you know what, for anyone who skips like the intro chatter, mm. now you know. It's not all just rambling and bad jokes and the two of us insulting each other. Hmm. It's like 90% rambling and bad jokes and the two of us insulting each other. And, and then like 5% warning you about potential trauma. And the, and the other 5% is silence while we're trying to figure out what the fuck we're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> that too. So this one, I promise, will be far lower on the cringe scale. 100% hmm. fewer dog beheadings. Sweet. So here's how we're going to start. We're going to start with a thought experiment. Oh, God. Imagine it's the future, and you and your partner decide to have a baby. Hmm. For some reason, you want to take on that responsibility and also subject a child to this terrifying world. You're either a massive optimist or a massive masochist, or maybe a sadist. I, I don't know which it is. I mean, you know me, so... Wrong. All of the above? Yeah. <laughs> but regardless, against all reason, you decide to pluralize. That's what, That's my word for... <laughs> reproduction <laughs> and how do we know shane will never reproduce because he calls it pluralizing well there may come a time in the future when the process of baby making looks far different than it does today hmm. instead of heading to the bedroom and or like bending each other over the kitchen table or putting on the gimp outfit or whatever you do hmm. you instead head to your local clinic and a nurse appears and hands you a menu. It's like a build your own Bloody Mary. Have you seen those? Where you get uh, every possible option you could imagine from celery salt to olives to green beans. All you have to do is check a box. Have you ever seen these? No, but I, I find your comparisons and or phrasing <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> Describing a baby making process as a Bloody Mary is... <sighs> this uh, terrifying is accurate and appropriate for this episode. Fair enough. As you will find. So you get a menu. It's, it's do you want your child to be over six feet tall do you want blonde hair did you want brown eyes blue eyes some of the options obviously would be no-brainers all babies by law at this point will be genetically edited so that they're immune to hiv and parkinson's disease and sickle cell but of course many of the other options come with a price hmm. the clinic has already performed the required credit check and based on your particular financial situation and your health insurance coverage many of the options on the menu are already grayed out so, for instance, you don't get to choose whether your child has the additional muscle mass that would come with the athlete package. Hmm. Short-term memory upgrade, that's out of your price range. Also, your insurance only covers immunity to 14 of the 55 optional diseases. Hmm. See, you haven't been financially successful enough to purchase the advantages that your child would need to become truly successful itself, which means that your child's future limitations are hardwired in based on your bank account. And when it comes time for your children to design their children those same disadvantages will be passed down to the next generation, widening the gap between rich and poor. This is free market eugenics. This is the new genetic capitalism. So Gattaca. Basically. So you make your selections and leave your deposit, uh, both financial and biological. Depending on your finances, maybe you qualified for the upgraded uh, pleasure robot experience. 
<laughs> which your sample is extracted by a lifelike humanoid robot. Ew. But if you're too poor to bang a machine, you're stuck with inseminating a plastic cup like some kind of sex peasant. <laughs> arms, arms for the sex robot. <laughs> As you head out the door of the clinic, you don your required gas mask because the government has recently declared threat level orange. You see, the newest version of an infectious bioweapon created by a gene hacking community was unleashed on the public the previous Friday, and the government hasn't yet provided the weekly drug cocktail that keeps you one step ahead of the terrorists. Mm. You head out the door and to the edge of the clinic's launch platform and leap into the abyss, plunging toward the street below. Disaster is averted at the last second as your Monsanto-branded eagle wings unfurl from your shoulder blades and you soar off into the clouds, squinting through your gas mask at the smog-smeared horizon. Parts of this I find awesome. Parts of this I find <laughs> fantastically and frighteningly possible. Do you have any idea what we're talking about today? I mean, it's genetic editing on some level. I just don't know. I mean, is it CRISPR or what? CRISPR indeed. Feck. Now, obviously, there's no guarantee that this apocalyptic scenario that I imagined is going to come to pass. Hmm. But it's also not just fanciful science fiction. This is one absolutely realistic future path for humanity based on the potential of this recent technological breakthrough in the field of gene editing. And hmm. yes, we are talking about CRISPR. This might be the most important episode we've released. Not because the episode itself is important, but just because of the magnitude of what we're discussing today. Okay. Okay. I know you've seen one of my favorite movies because we have discussed it before and you brought it up. The retro futuristic science fiction masterpiece Gattaca. Mm -hmm. I watched it again for this episode and it is as great as I remember. That is a great movie. It is. It's just fucking awesome all the way through. It holds up. The type of technology showcased in Gattaca is already changing the world in the form of an advancement that I'm going out on a limb and saying is going to be more consequential than penicillin and the internet combined. Well, yeah, penicillin doesn't really fucking matter if you can genetically modify somebody to be like, bacteria? What bacteria? Yeah, this is the new frontier. I mean, this is, you know, space is not the final frontier. The final frontier is inwards and changing people. This is becoming gods, is mm. what this is. Mm. And just in case you're skeptical, uh, researchers have already used this technology to engineer pigs the size of house cats, hornless cows, dogs built like linebackers, and human babies that are immune to the AIDS virus. And this technology isn't limited to high-tech laboratories. Anybody with even a basic understanding of biology can buy CRISPR kits these days for less than $200 online. Yeah, that seems like a good investment. <laughs> hey, want to fuck with your basic genetic makeup on your, you know, in your spare time? No, don't do that. Take up fucking brewery. Like, did you take up take up making your own craft beers, not your own craft genetics. That's kind of what this is. Yeah, it is surprisingly easy to do, as you will find out. Like, you do not have to be a mad scientist like we talked about last time with Einstein hair in some laboratory with beakers. You can just be a dude. You can just, which is the worst. As we have learned in every mass shooting over the last three weeks, the scariest thing in the world is a dude. Mm -hmm. And these dudes aren't just limited to weapons anymore, physical weapons. Now they can buy potential biological weapons and just start mucking around. I mean, I think even more terrifying than that, if this is the, what I think it is because I saw a documentary on this, it's just dudes experimenting in their spare time in their kitchen. Like, hey, I want to be immune to the common cold forever. Let's see what we can do about this. And then they accidentally trigger some sort of weird genetic feedback loop. And then they create the most toxic thing ever. The zombie apocalypse. Yeah. So gene editing is real. It is simultaneously exciting and terrifying. And our dystopian Gattaca future is just over that smoggy horizon. In fact, the pioneering scientists who identified and harnessed this technology, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, uh, both of whom shared the 2020 Nobel Prize in chemistry, they also share the fears of what their technology could unleash. Hmm. Jennifer Doudna, in particular, she has spearheaded a series of conferences and global summits to discuss the threat posed by CRISPR and its ability to edit the so-called germline, which is basically custom baby making. That's Gattaca. Hmm. She has agonized over her role in CRISPR, as she once publicly described waking up soaked and trembling from a nightmare inspired by fears of her creation, quote, I was really horrified, but I went into a room and there was Adolf Hitler. He had a pig face and I could only see him from behind and he was taking notes. And he said, I want to understand the uses and implications of this amazing technology. I woke up in a cold sweat and that dream has haunted me from that day because suppose somebody like Hitler had access to this. We can only imagine the kind of horrible uses he could put it to, unquote. 
Yes. And I am hearing another quote unquote scientist in my head going, you were so busy trying to figure out if you could, you didn't stop to think if you should. <laughs> That's a good example. Yeah. 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 Now, obviously, this is a complicated and highly technical subject, but I'm going to try to make it accessible and interesting. We're going to cover what CRISPR is, where it came from, and how it is inevitably going to revolutionize almost every aspect of human existence. Okay. So up until CRISPR, gene editing in the sense of true genetic manipulation, like the aforementioned custom-designed made-to-order babies, and real-time repairing of genetic defects, that was all just hypothetical. Mm. And we knew it was a possibility, but until 2012, it was still basically science fiction. CRISPR changed everything. Okay. So CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R, like a tech startup. They douched it out. It's fine. I got it. Cut one letter out. I, that always bugs me. But this is an acronym, okay. and it stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Say that three times fast, I fucking dare you. See, I, I promised I'd make it simple and interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I swear it is not as complicated as it sounds. In the simplest terms, CRISPR has been described as genetic scissors. It allows scientists to target specific sections of DNA and then cut them out and replace them with customized versions. Yeah, you say that, and then I remember all of the stupid shit I've done with scissors over my lifespan <laughs> between, you know, cutting a thumbnail in half or just, you know not staying inside the lines. It, it just lends itself to all kinds of imaginings that are just not good. Don't run with CRISPR. No. So with CRISPR, we can address genetic flaws, uh, basically repairing mutations and even curing genetic diseases. Hmm. And that's not all. We can even splice DNA from one animal into another. Sweet. These are capabilities that most scientists did not think that we would develop for generations. They probably were hopeful. <laughs> Please don't let us do this. Please don't. Ah, fuck. Ah, God damn it. <laughs> now we got pig faces. Now we got pig faces and gills. Who the fuck wanted a pig face with gills? And the reason the technology was developed so soon is because we didn't develop it. Hmm. The geniuses behind the creation of this world-changing technology have names like Streptococcus pyogenes. Those aren't geniuses. Those are bacteria. We owe the greatest medical breakthrough of our lifetimes to bacteria. CRISPR was not created in a lab. Like so many other world-changing advancements, such as fire and penicillin and loofah sponges and catnip, CRISPR was simply discovered fully formed in nature and harnessed by brilliant visionaries for the benefit of humanity. Or the rich. Whatever. Catnip is better than Netflix, by the way. It is oh, yeah. Endlessly entertaining. Endlessly. As long as you don't have one of those cats that's just like a turbo Ginsu and just wants to just take your leg apart. No, my after cat. After a sniff. Yeah. Mouse would, if you gave her catnip, you had to step back. But it was still entertaining. It was like, you know, it was like the button that made the uh, Tasmanian devil. It was, <laughs> like, <laughs> it was like a wood chipper <laughs> on steroids. Sweet. So to understand the origins of CRISPR, you have to go back to 1987. And you have to understand a concept that I feel like I probably always knew but didn't really think about until researching this episode. Bacteria can get sick. Mm -hmm. Just like us, bacteria, they're susceptible to viruses. And just like us, they don't really enjoy the experience of being virused. <laughs> Viride? So also, just like us, they have developed immune systems that fight back. <laughs> but their immune systems are not just like ours. Theirs as a unique strategy... When an invading virus strikes, the bacteria's immune system carves up the invader and then retains snippets of its genetic material as a kind of fingerprint to identify similar threats. Oh, wow. Okay. Bacteria have developed these genetic scissors, and all that was left was for some enterprising scientists to leverage those scissors and, boom, designer babies. Fun. I, still, all I'm seeing is a bunch of people in lab coats running around with scissors. It's just it's the way my mind works. Except, of course, it wasn't that simple. The discovery of CRISPR was far from an aha moment. Hmm. It was more like a, huh, type of <laughs> moment. Those are my favorites. CRISPR represents more than just the pinnacle of science. It also represents a wasted opportunity shared by multiple diverse scientific teams around the world. Hmm. It is kind of heartwarming to know that so many countries on Earth share equally in the squandering of this historic technology. <laughs> We're all dumb dumbs together. The first potential CRISPR discoverer, who could have written a chapter in history but instead became a footnote in science textbooks, was Japanese researcher Yoshizumi Ishino. Hmm. Ishino and his team accidentally cloned a CRISPR sequence. They noted its anomalies, and then they uh, shrugged and went to lunch before moving on to their important task at hand, sequencing the genome of gut bacteria. 
They were just like, ah, this is interesting and moving on. Yeah, they didn't, uh, they didn't know what they had. Hmm. Six years later, in 1993, a group of Dutch researchers again identified and again failed to capitalize on the anomalous repeating sequences of CRISPR. Uh, next, in 2001, Spanish researcher Francisco Mojica and his colleague Rude Johnson uh, finally gave it a name. They, quote, proposed the acronym CRISPR, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, to alleviate the confusion stemming from the numerous acronyms used to describe the sequences in the scientific literature, unquote. <laughs> to alleviate the confusion. <laughs> Thank God they alleviated that confusion. <laughs> Truly. It's, uh, it's all clear to me now. I mean, it's as clear as cardboard for me. What? So now CRISPR had a brand new, complicated, and intimidating name, as befitting any scientific discovery, but still no one had truly grokked what it would be capable of. Hmm. It wasn't until 2005 that a few different groups of researchers independently figured out that some of these so-called spacers in bacterial CRISPR were made up of snippets of DNA from invaders that had attempted to attack bacterial cells. Hmm. They theorized that CRISPR had something to do with the immune response of bacteria to invaders, and of course, now we know that they were right. The full name of the genetic tool, and you might have heard this, is CRISPR-Cas9. And it was the Cas9 part that proved to be the real key. Hmm. So in our DNA scissors analogy, you could say that CRISPR represents the hands guiding the scissors. It kind of directs the action. Hmm. And Cas9 represents the blades of the scissors and does the actual cutting. So okay. the CRISPR RNA finds the right sequence and then Cas9 snips. Gotcha. In 2011, French researcher Emmanuel Marie Charpentier met UC Berkeley's Jennifer Ann Doudna at a conference, and the two of them realized that they were working in the same area of research, and they decided to Voltron up and collaborate. With our powers combined, we can fuck up everything! Yay! <laughs> so anyway, together they figured out that CRISPR could be harnessed in the form of guide RNA molecules, aka CRISPR RNA, or cRNA, which work in tandem with Cas9. It's obviously not quite that cut and dried, but this is a podcast, not a lecture. We're going to... This is a podcast, not a fucking TED Talk on microbiology and science and genetics. And we're idiots. This I is, mean... What do you expect from us? <laughs> we're doing you our don't best. know that by now. <laughs> and the truth is that compared to most biological technologies, CRISPR is relatively uncomplicated. One of the beauties of CRISPR, or maybe one of the downsides, depending on how you look at it, is its simplicity. With minimal equipment, CRISPR gene editing could potentially be accomplished by a grad student or a hobbyist or a you. Oh, God. <laughs> you, the way you pointed it, yes, <laughs> your eyes got all like dull and glassed over and you were like a you. And I just, yes, I experienced the same moment of terror because I know me. That's the thing is you don't need to fully understand CRISPR to use it. Mm. Always the best type of science. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to fully understand why a machine gun shoots fully automatic. You could just shoot it into a crowd and zang. To be fair, I don't understand a single thing in this studio. So, <laughs> and I use all of it. Not, uh -huh. not well. <laughs> and probably with equally disastrous consequences. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we did just spend three hours trying to record our intro to the Patreon. So that makes sense. <laughs> But look, now that I've made this technology sound miraculous and simple and error-free, I take it all back. Good. Except the miraculous part. It is relatively simple and miraculous, but there are still major barriers to the mainstreaming of this technology, so don't panic just yet. Okay. The challenge is getting CRISPR to replace the snipped DNA with the segment that you actually want. That sounds even more terrifying. You're like, yes, I would love to have rainbow-colored fingernails for the rest of my life. Oh, shit. No, now I have eel fingernails. What, where did that even come from? <laughs> well, they had different strategies. So in the beginning, the best strategy was just to flood the cell with the preferred DNA and hope that most of the cell's repairs like utilized your snippet. Mm -hmm. But that approach very haphazard and can result in errors known as off-target mutations, mm. which is how we will inevitably end up with zombies or vampires. Right. One or the other. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, recent advancements by a German team have created a new process, one in which the dual strands of DNA are not sliced, but rather one of them is simply nicked. It's, it's more precise and less prone to errors. Hmm. Uh, yet another research team in Zurich, Switzerland, has swapped Cas9 for Cas12a, which allows them to edit multiple genes simultaneously with uh, more precision. Hmm. Maybe the key is just a, a higher number of Cas. I think I've, I've figured it out. 
<laughs> or just a higher number of Germans. <laughs> Jump to cast 1,025,000. It's, mm-hmm. it's got to be better. Yep. Has to. Bold solutions. That's what we're missing here. Scientists are way too careful. That's the problem. <laughs> We need we need more that's the recklessness in laboratories. That's what, that's what I think. This, the, Weren't we just arguing against the zombie apocalypse? I feel like you're not listening. So anyway, as noted, the biggest problem with CRISPR has always been that gene cutting and editing is very precise, but the repair can be haphazard. Mm. So research right now is focused on refining the process, and we're going to see giant leaps uh, considering the sheer volume of resources that are being pumped into this field. Mm. So what have scientists accomplished with CRISPR so far? Well, the technology's ability to cure disease is not just hypothetical or theoretical, it is already happening. Some of the greatest successes for CRISPR have come in the form of treatments for sickle cell disease. Hmm. Do you know much about uh, sickle cell? I know that it occurs primarily in the African-American population, and it was uh, an old genetic mutation slash adaptation to malaria. That is all correct. Yes, it's a genetically inherited blood cell disorder. The red blood cells of sickle cell patients actually take on the shape of like sickles or crescents, Mm -hmm. thus the name. And it does primarily affect African-Americans, 90%. uh, Results in the inability to efficiently distribute oxygen, because obviously that's what red blood cells primarily do. Mm -hmm. It creates extreme fatigue and bouts of crippling pain. It's really terrible. Interestingly, like you said, the reason that it affects African-Americans is that it was believed to have been a mutation that initially protected against malaria. And so it primarily affected populations native to areas where malaria is prevalent. Right. There are also arguments that there are other diseases like this, like Tay-Sachs and other things like that, that that occur primarily in the Jewish or, you know, Hasidic populations. Interesting. Yeah. The first sickle cell patient treated with CRISPR was a 34-year-old mother named Victoria Gray, The procedure was performed in 2019, so pretty recently, but it has been a shocking success. Uh, It may not be considered a cure by the standard definition, but it totally eliminated her symptoms. Three years later, she is still pain-free. I call that a cure in my book. Okay, sorry. For a second, I thought you were going to say something truly dark, like, I mean, she's dead. (laughs) (laughs) It's another type of cure. It it did solve the problem. No more pain. Nope. Of the more than 45 patients who have now been treated, almost half of them experienced similar results. Damn. So, Mm. you know, pretty good, but not perfect. Mm. That is less than 50% success rate. So we got a ways to go. Oh, and of course, uh, being treated with CRISPR costs around a million dollars and bone marrow transplants involve giant needles and immense pain. But, you know, you have a less than 50% chance of getting better. I guess it must be really bad if you're like, bring it. Yeah, I can only imagine because wifeness now has the the vertigos. And if someone was like, hey, so it's around a 40% chance this will cure you, but we can stick ginormous gauge needles into every single bone segment of your body and pull some stuff out and mix it around, martini it up and throw it back in. Might help. She'd be like, okay, so we're going into debt, honey. Yeah. I mean, I, I do understand why they would go through with it. Mm. The risk is, is certainly worth it, mm. uh, especially if you're in that much pain. But I do feel really terrible for the people for whom it doesn't work. Because, oh, yeah. oh God, what a disaster. That I mean, you're getting the shot with these things and all the stress and the recovery time. And then it's like, uh, oops. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But, you know, it's better than nothing, honestly. And for those people that are healed, I mean, that's huge. That is life changing. I would like to see the, the, the long, you know, term studies, like sure they're healed. And then five years later they grow horns. <laughs> like, you know, what's children going on? are minnows. Yes. Like, <laughs> what, what exactly are we talking here? We'll find out because mm-hmm. it's happening. Now, as we've mentioned, CRISPR isn't just about treating disease and addressing medical problems in humans. Uh, for instance, gene editing in crops promises to revolutionize farming. We've already seen CRISPR helping us develop strains of rice that can increase crop yields by, like, orders of magnitude. Really? CRISPR can also relatively easily be harnessed to knock out the specific genetic sequence that inhibits development of muscle mass, so we can create cows and chickens who are dramatically more swole, Mm. yielding far more meat. Okay, (laughs) you say that... (laughs) Like, it's a positive thing. But it's hard enough to keep chickens in line. I've had chickens, and they're annoying, ornery little fuckers. If the rooster that made me crash my first bike happened to be yoked into the bargain, (laughs) that bike would have been fucked up, and so would I. It's terrible, though, because we already have these chickens that are, like, bred to have these huge breasts, and they Mm -hmm. can barely stand. I mean, these chickens are not going to be super chickens. They're going to be genetic freaks who are miserable. They're going to be, like they won't even be able to walk, you know, it'll just be lumps of meat. This I do not like. 
I'd prefer to focus on vat-grown meats, as we've talked about in the past, to completely eliminate the need for death and slaughter. CRISPR, by the way, can help in that area as well. Game on. A startup called Memphis Meats, which is backed by luminaries like Bill Gates and Richard Branson, they've already begun experimenting with using CRISPR to create vat-grown meats without the use of fetal bovine serum, which is a mixture made from cow blood that is currently used to nourish the vat-grown tissue. So the way it works now is you, you're you not killing a cow for the meat, but then you have to pour cow blood all over the meat to keep it supple. And so you're basically, st- I mean, it's not any better. You're vampirizing <laughs> yeah. a bunch of cows to feed one chunk of cow. It's pretty hideous. I mean, yeah. you're, you know, pouring the life essence of another animal. You're absorbing the life essence of an animal into, I mean, this is mad scientist stuff. It's it's Vlad Stakula. Yeah. Yeah. It's not great. But mm-hmm. this would actually cut out that process, that part of it, and could create actual uh, lab-grown meat that doesn't require the juicing of cows for <laughs> for succulentness. Mm. <laughs> Succulentinity? <laughs> so anyway, CRISPR has the real potential to reduce suffering and solve world hunger. Like, this is going to be huge. Mm-hmm. I'm waiting for the butt. There's such a loud butt here. Not really. I think there is a butt for some people. Like, of course, the use of genetic manipulation in animals and plants. You get all the standard controversies about frankenfood and GMOs, which I don't even really want to get into because we have talked about this. And it is just infuriating. If mm. you are starving in a desert, you do not care if your tomato was genetically modified to be you know, more red or whatever. Like, mm. you just need those calories. So everyone who's listening, please get over your fears of GMO food. Every scientist will tell you this too. Pretty much every fruit and vegetable that you eat today has been modified from its natural state. Selective breeding is ultimately just a form of genetic manipulation, and we've been using it for generations. You know, do you think corn and apples and tomatoes look like they do now, like a hundred years ago? No. No. They look like maize. And if we ever want to travel the stars in gigantic friggin' motherships or whatever the fuck we call them generation ships we don't want to be carrying a bunch of cows farting and belching and throwing up and procreating we want vats of meat grown in the friggin you know cells lining the walls that will protect us from radiation and just you know keep going into the stars yeah stop being scared of the future the future in this case is something that is actually going to save a lot of lives that is a huge thing there you pick your battles and this is not a battle that anyone should fight if you are a ridiculous hippie and you care about gmo food that means you have more food than you need and check your privilege (laughs) or go you know spend a few months years in a third world country and you know be real hungry for a while tell you Tell them that they shouldn't be eating a GMO tomato. Just go fuck yourself. Like, there are children dying. Just give them food. But changing the subject away from food, here's another something to think about. Thousands of athletes have been banned and or they have, like, asterisks next to their name based on the use of performance-enhancing drugs, right? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what's going to happen when they get their hands on CRISPR home kits? (laughs) Oh, shit. Like I said, this stuff is not out of reach of the science hobbyist. And when it gets to the point where all you have to do is inject like a fizzy solution into your butt cheeks and you can edit your genes with something you bought on the dark web, just think about the kind of asterisks that we'll need for those record books. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the first person who wants to beat Usain Bolt is just going to be like, cheetah genetics, sweet, doink. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, American sprinters have shattered Olympic records and are celebrating on the podium with their tails held high. <laughs> Showing a lot of fang there in that photo. <laughs> I mean, seriously, will athleticism even be meaningful in the future? I don't, I don't, the genetic engineers are going to be the new stars. Those are the people who are like, they're going to, you know, release their creations like an auto mechanic showing off their new hot rod. It'll be like, look at what I have created. Yeah. yeah. And how far can this genetic engineering go when it comes to athletic ability? Super strength? Is this the first step to the real life Marvel universe? Mm, you'd have to figure out a way to A, increase bone density, B, increase muscle mass in the heart and a bunch of other stuff. Like, you'd have to do some serious tinkering, but maybe. I think that's definitely coming. We're going to be adjusting every part of the human at some point. Mm. And so, yeah, why not? 
So the upcoming applications of CRISP are practically limitless. Uh, in the near future, scientists in China and the University of Pennsylvania have already started experimenting with CRISPR as a cancer treatment. And when it comes to HIV, CRISPR has the potential not only to cure people infected with the disease, but also to adjust our genetics so that we're not susceptible to the immune disorder in the first place. Hmm. And once again, China is taking the lead, uh, forging bravely forward in the most reckless and irresponsible possible way. In 2019, Chinese researchers genetically edited two human embryos to make them immune to HIV. Hmm. I'm not sure how we're going to find out if that worked, but, you know, gutsy, I guess. Gutsier if the kids grow up and decide to actually put that immunity to the test. I don't... <laughs> Other diseases for which CRISPR shows amazing potential, uh, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, <laughs> and then there are various mental illnesses that can be targeted as well. And researchers are even moving beyond genetic diseases to physical disabilities like blindness. Uh, as we speak, a company called Editis Medicine is engaged in phase one and two trials to potentially treat the most common cause of genetic childhood blindness, Lieber congenital amaurosis. You shit, you said that pretty well. I couldn't even spell that. I don't know that I did. That okay. might be completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute <laughs> gobbledygook. So we've covered many of the medical applications of CRISPR, but how close are we to using this to edit the germline? Like, is it really poised to become the first potential step down the slippery slope to eugenics? Hmm. Well, not exactly, because the first step down that slope was already taken years ago. You might be surprised to learn that the groundwork for genetic selecting of embryos has already been laid, so to speak. Hmm. I assume you know about in vitro fertilization, yeah. in which eggs are removed from the mother and sperm is removed from the father. They're combined in a test tube, usually results in multiple embryos. For years, those embryos have been screened for diseases and genetic defects, and the most desirable of them selected for implantation. Right. This is called pre-implantation genetic testing. It is straight up Gattaca light. And it's been a reality for decades. You can even choose your baby's gender, and it is totally legal. So CRISPR isn't necessarily breaking new ground or violating any laws. It's just poised to boost an existing process to another level. With current pre-implantation genetic testing, we're limited to screening for just a few diseases like Huntington's and sickle cell, but cancer susceptibility, heart disease, Alzheimer's, even asthma can't currently be detected, but that's going to change in the near future. And then what's to stop us from also choosing, you know, eye color and personality and height? I would like to choose personality if I could do it. I'd be like, okay, I would like all of the beauty of my, you know, of wifeness and I and and none of the fat fats that I have and none of the depression we occasionally get. I What parent wouldn't want to be able to, you know, edit out potential future maladies and, and disadvantages? It's going to be, I think too tempting to not yeah i would keep all the alcoholism though <laughs> yes yeah. jesus what you gotta have a few like little hiccups you gotta deal with otherwise you're just gonna be a little whiny beach <laughs> i want my child to have at least three vices i'm just gonna like check the randomize one randomize these vices could be heroin could be meth could be alcohol could be pokemon go who cares i hope that's one of the choices on the list is a little bitch you can check the option for your child to be a little bitch. Yeah. That's what I, I, I'm a little bit. Why would I not, why would I want my child to be more of a badass than me? Be like me. <laughs> I want, yeah, I want to see myself in this child. So he's got to oh, be a little bitch. You will. <laughs> <laughs> well, I asked what's to stop us from doing that. Mm. A lot, actually, it turns ah. out. Here's the thing about choosing personality mm. and like intelligence and th it's not so simple because there are a lot of different elements that go into those traits right well right because we always say intelligent but but intelligence actually means information it's intellect that helps you deal with the intelligence you have right and how do you even define intelligence is it like iq is it you know we have things like that are more nebulous like street smarts and right. emotional intelligence and all these things can set you up for success. Most intelligent people aren't necessarily the most successful. In fact, intelligence may correlate to things like depression and paranoia. You know, the more intelligent you are and the more you understand the world around you, the more sad and miserable you're going to be because the world is a terrible place. <laughs> I think, you know, if we want our kids to be happy, mm -hmm. make them dumb AF. Pretty and dumb. Pretty and dumb. That is the key to happiness. <laughs> Before you get excited about the idea of ordering a baby like a Whopper, you know, hold the pickles and scoliosis, keep in mind that many of the traits we might like to code for in our babies are not controlled by a single gene. There's no intelligence switch. 
Traits like IQ are the result of a complex interplay of genetic components, and sometimes it's even hard to agree on the exact traits that would be desired or desirable. You know, which genes control motivation and charisma and mm -hmm. gregariousness? We don't know. There's no, there's not a simple on off switch for these. Yeah. If they can ever figure out what the genetic coding is for resilience, I would just put all of my, you know, skill points in that. Just be like, make my kid able to recover from anything. That is interesting. It, it, less like a Bloody Mary menu and more like a video game. Uh, RPGs. Yeah. Character building. Yeah. Character building screen. Yeah. Yeah. The other factor is that, look, like we might be able to successfully screen for clinical depression, but nature is only half the battle. Yeah. Nurture can still create misery and sadness. Yeah. So like you said, maybe you want to focus more on resilience and ability to overcome the trials and tribulations of life. That might set people up for success more than something like intelligence. Yeah. And when it comes to genetic coding for physicality, the situation is equally complicated. You know, we might be able to easily code for eye color, but what about overall structural symmetry? You know, attractiveness is created by more than one aspect of physical appearance. You can be like, I want a, a little ski slope nose, and, and then they're born with a large face and they're going to look totally weird, right? Right. Because proportion is really the issue. It's not that like having a small nose is attractive. Having a small nose isn't attractive if you have a big face. Having a big nose looks really weird if you have a small face. So, you know, it's all about kind of proportions and symmetry, right? Right. And if you get a perfect nose that's really big on a perfect face that's really big, then you have a bobblehead baby. And that's going <laughs> to exactly. look weird. Exactly. And so it's, you know, it's the proportion of the entire body. And, and so there's so much that goes into this. And that's why, like I said... This is coming, but it's going to be a ways off. Right. And while we're busy trying to figure all this stuff out, CRISPR is potentially going to become the battleground for the next Cold War, an international genetic arms race. Different countries are going to place different restrictions on gene editing, and holding back could be a ticket to irrelevance. Hmm. If the USA does not allow scientists free reign to experiment, what happens if, if China does and we get left in the dust? I, I cannot argue for more Mengele. I just can't. I would I would rather be on the losing side, but, you know, die with a clean, bloodless fate than, than sure, I mean, we sacrificed half our friggin' population, mostly the poor. It's the same thing as being f afraid of GMO food. Like, GMO people are coming, mm -hmm. and it's we're either going to be on the cutting edge of this, or we're going to get left behind. I, I think we're both being mildly naive, because I don't think the U.S., even if we, you know, stick to our puritanical Christian guns and don't do this at all up front. You just mentioned third world countries with very few laws. We outsource now, bruh. We're just going to stick some of our scientists in said third world country, pipe a bunch of black off money their way and be like, here, create us superheroes off your fuck. And of course, you know, the FBI, CIA, NSA, they're going to be working on this stuff, whether we al technically allow it or not. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but the simple fact is, again, you can't be left behind. And if the Christian right or whatever wants to enact a bunch of laws, the government is still going to do this stuff. Yeah, because, they'll nod, smile, and do it somewhere else. Because we have to stay at least in lockstep with the rest of the world, if not a step ahead. So I'd say we jump forward. I want lion children. Splice me up. I, I, I want, you know, cheetah eagle children too, but I, I don't want to sacrifice half of the, the country's poor folk in psychotic labs to do it uh, but it's not it's going to be rich people at first and i think it's going to be like the instagram crew like anyone who's willing to inject we're already like injecting stuff into your butt to make it huge you know and people are dying from it left and right mm -hmm. and they're willing to keep doing this because the potential payoff is worth it for them yeah. it's going to be genetic influencers yeah and also i think we can't avoid doing this stuff because we have to be prepared for the next biological weapon. And like I talked about in my initial apocalyptic scenario, like it's going to be an arms race of bioweapons. I've mentioned how much I love talking to you sometimes, right? <laughs> this is just ray of fucking sunshine. <laughs> I'm going to skip all the way to my car and off a cliff. Well, we have to think about this stuff. This stuff is coming. And I think that we can't be scared of it mm. because this genetic cat is out of the bag. And so we have to reckon with it. Mm -hmm. And that means I think that we have to take the reins on it and become the leaders in this technology so that we're not victims of it. So this episode, pretty fascinating to me. I wish I had more answers and fewer questions. Mm -hmm. But it's just too damn early to say very much with certainty, except that we're already in the throes of the CRISPR revolution, like it or not. Hmm. 
the roller coaster is ticking up the ramp and it's way too late to get off. So all we can do is hold on and hope for the best and try to enjoy the ride. I will inject myself with things that help me hold on like tentacles and things that help me if I don't hold on like wings. I will be Cthulhu bird. You will inject yourself with tentacles? Yes. That sounds very manga hentai porn. <laughs> Stop looking at my search engine. <laughs> we have uh, some new patrons. Oh, we're we at have... the end of the episode. <laughs> I got to remember, you don't actually believe in ending <laughs> episodes. You just transition <laughs> like a break check. I don't know what else there is to say about this one. I do, like I said, I do feel that this is probably the most important episode. Like when we look back in the future, again, it's not an important episode. No episode is important in itself. Hmm. But this topic, when we look back on it, all of the other things that we've talked about, nothing is going to change us like this. This CRISPR is the next revolution. It is going to change everything about the world. Eventually, it's going to make people who, you know, in the not, not too distant future, and I don't think we're going to be able to benefit from this, mm. but I think a couple generations down the line, I think people are going to be living 200, 300 years really soon. Hmm. And, you know, cancer is the, the modern plague. I mean, it is the worst thing. We just kind of ignore the fact that, like, we're living in a time of the worst plague in human history. It, it's so much worse than the Black Plague and, and everything else and COVID and everything else that's happened to us. Cancer is killing people fucking left and right. Mm -hmm. and CRISPR is going to come in and eventually change that. This is our our only hope as the, you know, this is our Obi-Wan. This is our Obi-Wan. Mm. Yeah. All right. And it also might completely end us. Which is fun. <laughs> but at least we'll have tails. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go into that long, dark night with tails. I want a prehensile tongue. I want a prehensile tail. I'm already named, my nickname is Monkey. I want a monkey tail. That would be so awesome. Well, I want that for you. Hmm. <laughs> I, I am, I'm optimistic, man. Thanks, man. I bet you the first thing I do is sit on it and break it like a I, dipshit. <laughs> I'm rooting for world peace and for you to have a prehensile tail. Thank you. Thank yep. you. You're a true friend. Things are equally important. <laughs> to me. So we have some new patrons. Yes. We have Chris Carlisle, a mm. new minion. Welcome, Chris. We have Julie, J-U-L-E-E. -E. That's a cool way of spelling Julie. Mm. She's also a minion. We have Amanda. She is a brand new menace. Welcome, Amanda. I like how being a menace is a good thing here. This is the only place where being a, a minion or a menace is a positive. I mean, I think in the movies, being a minion is great. Um, but uh, being a menace is almost never good unless you're a Miffy fan. In which case, zang. Or you're Dennis. <sighs> Could you stop aging us, please? <laughs> we have a new review. This is Jessica Ammon. A-M-M-O-N. Jessica Ammon. I like it. Sounds Egyptian. It does. Feels like I should be raising some sort of eye symbol towards her. Maybe she has a, the head of a jackal. Hmm. Sorry, Jessica. <laughs> Probably not. And wrong God. I mean, whatever. Call you dog face. That's not, <laughs> wow. That wasn't great. <laughs> and we're canceled yet again. <laughs> Thanks there, Shane. It says, great thing to listen to at night. Five stars. I am an avid consumer of random facts. This is a great thing to make my work day way less boring working the night shift. Thank you and keep it up. She works the days of the night shift. That's, I guess if you work the night shift, that's your work day. Yeah. 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 That's fair. All right. Well, we have merch, we have Instagram, we have Discord, and we have Patreon, as we've just explained. Please head to any one of these, show your support, rate it on Spotify, go to wherever fine podcasts are sold, and give us a review like Dearest Amon over there. And finally, and forever after, knowledge is power. Sleep is overrated.